All righty, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Estrada. I am a community representative for Mayor Todd Gloria. I have the pleasure of serving Council District 5. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for everyone who joined us today. Thank you for District 5 staff for helping us out in planning this and as well, of course, Council Member Von Wilpert for co-hosting with us today. And I'll hand it over to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Stephanie. And thank you so much to Mayor Gloria and your entire staff for putting together this event. I know it's been really difficult as we all got elected in December to be able to do community outreach in these times, but every day more vaccines are going out, case rates are going down, we're looking better and better. So I know hopefully this will be one of the last big events we have to do on Zoom, but we'll see. Um, I also wanna thank our, our community panelists and welcome them, Wally Walfolk from Scripps Ranch, Eric Edelman from Carl Mountain Ranch, Robin Kaufman is with us from Rancho Bernardo and Sarah Clayton from Penasquitos. And I can't see everyone on the Zoom, but I see a couple of familiar faces who I miss dearly seeing in person. I think I saw Lori Van Orden on there and Jenny Barassa and Marsha Linehan. And I'm sure there's many others who I can't see on all the Zoom screens. And this is really exciting for me because I've been now to all of our individual planning group meetings and town council meetings. But this is the first time I've had members representing almost all the D5 communities in one, one room. So I'm very excited. And I'm looking forward to hearing from our community members, answering some questions. But of course, I'm also here to listen and to learn. And that's one of the main reasons I ran for office was to listen to my community. And as many of you know, it is my hometown. I grew up in Scripps Ranch. And I'm very excited to see that um, my old elementary school, Miramar Ranch, will be opening on Monday, reopening for some of the students to come back. Um, thank you to, for being here. You as the community are the greatest source of information for our, our council office and for our mayor's office. You know, we've been working hard on the city's short and long-term COVID response and recovery plans. I'm co-chairing our COVID recovery committee here at the council, which Mayor Todd Gloria has been very supportive of. We're going to have on April 19th, our second meeting, and it will be focusing on small business owners and what we can do as a city to help them recover from the pandemic. And we're having a couple of D5 owners speak, including Ponce's Restaurant and Del Sur. They're going to explain to us what went really well, went really poorly, and how the city can build upon the relief that we've been giving. The Small Business Administration is coming, so it'll be a great discussion. It'll be 9 a.m. on April 19th. Uh, vaccinations continue to increase, and I'm sure the mayor will talk about this, but we just passed over a million in San Diego. Um, and also, I want to thank uh, the mayor for being so attentive to District 5. You know, when I first got elected, even before I was sworn in in December, Mayor Todd Gloria reached out to me and said, come down, tell me what the big issues are in District 5. And he's really followed up on them so quickly. I immediately told him, of course, about the Yanni's restaurant issue in the parking lot and making sure we find a compromise for housing issues and all many of his staff, including Stephanie on this call, have come down to meet with Yanni and Bob Ilko and a lot of others in Scripps to make sure we get open transparency and planning for that issue. Also, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor, for taking our fire safety concerns so seriously and helping us focus on brush management. I know we have a new fire station going in in Black Mountain Ranch area, 4S Ranch. Um, and I know others on this Zoom have been working for years to try and get another annex built in Scripps Ranch and other areas. So we'll keep focusing on those. Uh, you know, you, the mayor's office immediately addressed concerns we had in Rancho Bernardo with repairing fencing facilities at the Rancho Bernardo Community Park and, and other, other things we're all doing together. So I really wanna thank you for being so attentive to our district, always having an open door for me and our constituents. And I'm looking forward to answering everyone's questions. So thank you. Thank you, Marnie, uh, and good morning, everybody. It's great to be uh, in, in District 5 virtually. Um, wish we could do this in person. Uh, but what we're finding is this is a really effective way to be able to communicate with a lot of San Diegans at once. And you know, if we had had this uh, at a rec center or a public library in the district, uh, we might have gotten uh, a few dozen people. I think what we're finding is the attendance via this format is really beneficial. And we'll find some way going forward of making sure we balance uh, being able to do these things in person and virtually just with the eye of having maximum citizen participation. Truly grateful to all of you for being here this evening, uh, this this morning. Um, it's Marnie and I have difficult jobs. 
generally, made harder during a pandemic, particularly as elected representatives, we have to really work hard to make sure that we're in touch with all of you, understand what your concerns and your priorities are, and that's really what this morning is about. Uh, and if I may just take a point of personal privilege, you all have done a very good thing for the city by electing Marnie to be your council representative. She is incredibly hardworking, very diligent. Uh, she is often in touch advocating, uh, and she's laser focused. I'm really um, appreciate her very clear priorities that she uh, lays out for uh, my office with regard to District 5, and we're doing our be very best to try and keep up with those high standards. Uh, you guys deserve to have the best representation. Marnie and her team are doing a great job, and so Marnie, I appreciate your partnership in trying to lead the city during these difficult times, and look forward to getting past this current uh, challenge of the pandemic and resulting recession, and get on to being able to work on really the issues, particularly at a neighborhood level, that I, need, I know are so important. What I'd like to do this morning um, is to give you a quick update uh, from the mayor's office, if you will. Uh, and then we have a number of community leaders here who um, have questions uh, that we wanna try and field. And then we have uh, an opportunity to uh, hopefully uh, field a number of other questions from folks who are participating this morning. Uh, probably one caveat to put at the top, um, this is not your last chance to interact with our office. And in fact, District 5 is well served by Stephanie Estrada from my team. And so I'd ask you to be in touch with Stephanie with any of your concerns if we can't get to your question today um, or going forward, you think of something that's important or you have that proverbial pothole somewhere on Pomerado or somewhere and you want to report that, uh, Get It Done app is the best way. Um, but you can also be in touch with Councilmember Von Wilpert's office or with Stephanie in my office. Between all of us, hopefully we'll be able to get that taken care of for you. Um, so in terms of an update, you know, I think it's not an exaggeration to say that I've spent most of my time, uh, Marnie's the same given her uh, committee, uh, spending most of our time on COVID response. Uh, this is our 120th day in office and uh, there's nothing I've spent more time on and I think you understand why. Uh, we have uh, tried our level best to do what we can to reduce infections and increase vaccinations. And one of the ways that we've done that as a city is to have every member of our fire rescue staff uh, uh, authorized to give vaccines. Uh, that means that the over 240 folks uh, in that department, firefighters, paramedics, uh, lifeguards, uh, have been out in the community uh, doing vaccinations. Um, and the fruits of that are evident. You know, obviously we have now, this just past week, moved to the orange tier. Um, that is because our infection rates are falling, our vaccine rates, rates are rising. Now I wanna be clear, the county is the lead on the vaccination effort. They are our public health agency for San Diego, but the city has really been playing an assistive role in trying to fill in gaps where they may occur. And so that means we've had our municipal gym open where we have been vaccinating members of the public and our city staff. Uh, we have been out in communities where infection rates are extremely elevated. Um, that's been places like South San Diego, Southeast San Diego, Mid City. And by focusing in those areas and bringing down the infection rates, that is what has allowed the state to allow us to move into the orange tier. Um, and so um, I guess what I'm trying to say is I think our strategy is working, um, but this really, of course, is still a time to remain vigilant. Um, I humbly ask you to continue to follow the public health order, wear face coverings when in public and maintain social distance. Um, but if you like what you're seeing um, in terms of our schools reopening come Monday and, and some of the reopenings of our economy, um, you still have a role that you can play in doing that. Uh, and the last and most important one is to get vaccinated when it's your turn. Uh, I think I'll speak for the council member. I, I believe both of us become eligible on, uh, on Thursday, uh, April 15th, when uh, everyone 16 and older can be vaccinated. Um, I've already got my plan to get vaccinated. I hope all of you who have yet, have yet to be vaccinated um, we'll figure out your path, whether it's through your healthcare provider, a community clinic, a neighborhood pharmacy, uh, figure out your plan, try and get an appointment and get vaccinated as quickly as possible. That is the quickest and most effective way I know of for us to get back to something re resembling normalcy. Um, although I recognize, you know, we won't be, um, we won't, we'll never go back to the way we were before. So much has changed. Noting that the pandemic is most important, probably the second most important is our economy. And like many of you who may have been personally impacted by the pandemic with regard to perhaps your employment or the income for yourself or for your family, uh, the city has been no different. Um, we have been hard hit by this pandemic. Every vacant hotel room is revenue that the city is not receiving. And those are dollars that we use to pave roads, pave firefighters, uh, get more library hours. Uh, to put it in some context for you, on the day that Marnie and I were sworn in uh, to our respective offices, the city was forecasting a $45 million mid-year budget deficit. That's a deficit right now, this year, right now. That number is now north of 80 million. And that gives you a sense of how rapidly deteriorating our revenue posture is. We're not spending more. 
Um, in fact, we're getting reimbursed by the federal government for many of the additional things we've been doing because of the pandemic. Um, but our revenues, again, the uh, empty hotel rooms uh, are really hurting our ability to, to move forward. Uh, next year, we're forecasting a more than $150 million budget deficit. And the reason why Marnie and I um, are not apoplectic at the moment, um, although I am still anxious, uh, is the fact that our federal government passed uh, the American Rescue Plan uh, a few weeks ago. I will tell you that without that infusion of federal dollars, we would be talking about pink slips, layoffs, drastic cuts to neighborhood services. Um, and we don't have to do that because uh, the federal government is going to send us about $306 million. So that 84 million plus the 150 million, you know, you're uh, no, obviously knocking on about a quarter of a billion. Uh, so this is a little bit extra than that. Don't get too excited. Uh, we're gonna need every one of those dollars for next year's, next, next, next year's budget to keep things flat. But point is what I could have been sitting here telling you is not necessary. Those firefighters and lifeguards that are providing vaccines right now are not gonna get fired uh, because we have to balance the budget. And I think that's all very good. Congressman Scott Peters uh, voted to support the American Rescue Plan. When next time you see him, please thank him. Uh, thank our president, vice president. This has really been a game changer for our ability to address um, our budget. That said, um, we do have a structural budget problem at the city. Um, even before the pandemic, the city was forecasting a rather significant budget deficit. And so when I propose our uh, new city budget on Thursday, uh, we will have some modest cuts in there because the uh, federal relief funds are one time, right? We're not gonna get that check every year going forward. Um, and we're gonna need to make some reductions. But again, those reductions can be much more modest much more manageable. And I think that's really important because right now a lot of people are hurting. They need access to their libraries to get on computers, to be able to apply for jobs. They need uh, you know, a response from our police department. And so uh, we're, we're going to do our best to, uh, to do a budget that really limits uh, impact to the community. Um, a couple of other key issues I want to hit, and then we'll go to the community leaders for their questions. Um, you know, I think what's been striking to me is that as we talk about the pandemic and the economy, what I'm asked about more than any other issue in the city, and I don't know if this is true for Councilmember Von Wilpert as well, um, is the issue of homelessness. Um, and that's again, pretty striking when considering that people are understandably concerned about their health and the health of their families and their finances and the finances of their families, that this continues to be an issue um, that I hear about in every corner of the city, not just in downtown, but really everywhere. Um, our city has been, uh, I think, trying to do better than it's done in the past. I'm trying to do better than the previous administration. And I'll tell you a couple of things that we've done. The convention center, as you know, has been closed to uh, visitors for over a year now. And that public facility, it's a building that you and I own as taxpayers of the city, um, was repurposed into a homeless shelter. Um, it operated until March 22nd of last month. And over that period of time, it served over 4,000 San Diegans. During that time frame, we were able to transition over 1,300 of those people into permanent supportive housing, so not returning them to the streets. I think it's been a significant success uh, and proof of what uh, rapid rehousing can do uh, to get people off the streets for good. Uh, we demobilized that effort in anticipation of, of conventions returning and also because we ran out of the dollars um, to keep it open. Uh, but the 600 or so people who were living there on March 22nd did not return to the streets. They were transferred to the city's other shelters, including the one uh, at City Hall where we have over 500 people uh, who shelter there currently. Um, and so uh, I'm very happy with that outcome and I want it to be instructive for what we can do as a city going forward when we really lean in and dedicate a significant amount of time and resources that are coordinated with our county partners, with nonprofit partners to get people off the streets. The other thing that we're doing is trying to re-envision how we do this work. I think many of you know that we heavily rely on the police department uh, to be our lead on homelessness. That's a very expensive uh, way to handle that problem. And it's not a national best practice when it comes to dealing with homelessness and unsheltered individuals. Uh, we have, uh, with Councilmember Von Wilpert's support, launched uh, a robust citywide uh, homeless outreach effort, not through our police department, but through an organization known as People Assisting the Homeless, or PATH. They have a long-term relationship with the city. They operate one of our city's shelters downtown. Um, and this infusion of dollars uh, has allowed us to stand up a homeless outreach team that is consisted of social workers and trained 
uh, clinicians. Uh, they operate in every city council district in the city. So this is not just downtown. This is not just our beach communities or the, the Mission Valley area. This is also inclusive of District 5. Um, and so I hope that folks will educate themselves about this outreach effort, work with the council member's office, with Stephanie in my office, uh, get to know your outreach workers for District 5. Uh, the idea is to build rapport with the individuals. Many of you have probably heard about people who don't want help. I don't think that someone who's suffering extreme mental illness and declines housing assistance is not wanting help. I think they're just not in a position Position to accept the help by having trained clinicians that can build rapport, build trust, go back day after day and build that relationship. I believe that's how we'll get people off the streets. It's how other cities have successfully done it. It's how we will do it. We've also announced some reforms to our city's cleanup efforts. We, let get, I want to be really clear, we must continue to do cleanups in our cities. Some of you may remember in 2017, we had a hepatitis A outbreak that killed uh, over 20 people, killed 20 people and infected over 500 San Diegans. That's because of the lack of sanitary conditions in many of our uh, homeless uh, encampments across the city. We must continue to provide hygienic services there, but we don't need to lead with law enforcement and we don't need to do it at night or during inclement weather when it's unsafe for both the unsheltered individual and for the city staff performing these tasks. My, uh, my administration has uh, stopped those particular efforts. We are now working on a process of having notification, uh, leading with homeless outreach work workers, having law enforcement take a step back um, and making sure that the, the, the effort is always trying to lead toward housing. I uh, appreciate Con Councilmember Von Wilpert's support of those efforts. Again, it aligns with national best practices and will be how I believe we can reduce the number of people who are living on our streets in the city. One little additional piece on this, because there's some confusion out in the community, and these are opportunities often to set records straight. Um, you may know, I think many of you know, uh, that we are currently sheltering uh, unaccompanied minors, uh, children um, who have appeared along our south southern border with Mexico um, at the convention center. Um, the homeless uh, uh, were scheduled to leave uh, the, home, the convention center, as I mentioned before. Um, we had run out of funding for that particular effort. It just happened to be that the federal government called um, the same weekend that we were preparing to move folks out and asked if we could accommodate these young people. Uh, the county and I said yes, uh, that we will do that. We have 1,450 young people who are living there currently. Their average stay will be about 30 days as they are reuni reunified with family members or with sponsors and have their immigration cases adjudicated in court. Um, this is the right thing to do. Otherwise, it means leaving children in incarcerated situations where they can't socially distance, where they don't have health care, nutritional services. Uh, we are running a fairly good operation down there, so good that the federal government called me the other day and asked if we'd be willing to take younger children, still up to the limit of 1450. We, that's the capacity in there. Um, but the quality services that people like Radies Children's Hospital are providing in that facility, um, it means that we would, we're doing a better job than most other cities who are doing similar efforts. Um, um, and so we're being asked to take children who are as young as five years old. Um, again, I think we can all agree, no matter their immigration status, five-year-olds in, in uh, cell, jail cells is not appropriate. And so we want to um, make sure that we uh, are doing right by that situation. But there is an, no, there's no truth to the situation that we kicked out homeless people to put uh, children in there. Um, that was going to happen. Um, and those homeless individuals are now uh, at other city shelters. Um, a couple other high points to hit and then we'll turn it over. I want to put out there that um, with Marnie's assistance, we have launched an $84 million rental assistance fund in the city. Um, this is an effort to help those of you who may be falling behind on your rent or your utility payments uh, because of the pandemic. Um, if that is your situation or you know someone who is, um, these dollars, which come from the federal and state governments, are available. Um, you can apply. You can check your eligibility and apply for these benefits at sdhc.org. Um, Matt's put that in the chat. That's fantastic. Um, this is also helpful to landlords who, who have uh, tenants who are not paying. Um, this incentivizes a conversation between the landlord and the tenant uh, to work collaboratively to apply for those dollars and extinguish that debt. Um, and so, again, we want to make sure people are aware of that. And I want to be very clear. There's no shame in asking for this help. There are literally thousands and thousands of San Diegans who are applying for this assistance. Uh, $84 million is a lot of money. And we want to make sure that those who are currently suffering because of the back rent or landlords who are concerned about making their mortgages because of the lack of rent payment avail themselves of these dollars. And it may be that we get some more money uh, in this particular account. The American Rescue Plan had some additional dollars for rent relief. We're waiting to hear from the federal government how much we may, we may get from there. 
the last thing I want to put on your table, and I know that this is a concern um, in D5, in part because you guys are inland, which means you have to run your air conditioning. Uh, I remember a very hot summer day last summer with Marnie uh, in Rancho Bernardo. It's a lot warmer than Mission Hills, I'll just tell you that. Um, and as a consequence, I know you guys have pretty significant energy bills, and as a, as a life, it means that I think you're very interested in something that Marnie and I are working on right now. Um, the city, as you may know, has a franchise agreement um, to, for electricity and gas services. Uh, our current provider is San Diego Gas and Electric. They've had the city's utility franchise for over 100 years. The current franchise agreement uh, was 50 years in length, and it expired last December. Uh, we worked, uh, the previous administration was not successful in uh, extending that particular agreement. Um, so Marnie and I worked together with our colleagues and extended it through June. I currently have on the street an invitation to bid uh, for folks who might want to be our energy provider going forward. Um, and we will open those bids uh, in a couple of days um, when we get submissions, assuming we get any submissions. Um, this is uh, relevant to D5 because I think many of you are interested in converting to things like solar to help reduce your energy bills. Uh, you may be concerned about rising energy rates. You're probably very concerned about climate change and its impacts it has on wildfires. And so what I'm looking for uh, in a new energy provider or a going forward energy provider is someone who will help us reach our climate goals, uh, someone who will work on things like utility undergrounding in a co cooperative fashion, uh, someone who uh, will help the city meet its goals for customer service and rates. Um, and so this is a pretty much a once in a generation opportunity. Um, you can go to the city's website and read more about our invitation to bid. Um, once we get bids or, or a bid or bids, uh, we will make that known to the public. Uh, and then the, the time frame going forward is, as I mentioned, the, the, the invitation to bid process ends next week. We will open those bids. Assuming we have a responsive bidder, uh, we'll start the process of negotiating with that individual. And my hope is to have a deal before the city council uh, for their consideration uh, sometime in May uh, to commence before the current agreement expires in June. We'll see how that all goes. It's a very uh, significant thing, uh, but I know it's relevant to the people of District 5, again, who, uh, who are obviously very concerned about wildfires and climate change, concerned about rates, concerned about solar adoption. Uh, the, there are a lot of ways that we can effectuate uh, more progress in those areas with this franchise deal. And with Marnie's help, we're gonna do our very best to get the best deal for the city and for our rate payers. So that's a lot to throw at you guys. And we still have a whole lot of time, so this is good. We'll, we'll transition to questions if that's great, but um, know that uh, I appreciate your time this morning. I appreciate the chance to share that update and I appreciate being able to work with Councilmember Von Wilford to create a city that works for all of us. And so I'll toss it back to the council member, it's Stephanie, it's to Stephanie. Thank God Stephanie's here. She solves all problems. Uh, <laughs> all righty, thank you so much, uh, council member Mom Wilper and Mayor Gloria for your remarks. Um, we'll be moving into the panelist questions. Our first panelist is Eric Edelman. He's the chair of the Cal Carmel Mountain and Sabre Springs Community Council. And so I'll hand it over to you, Eric. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, thank you, council member uh, Von Wilper. Thank you, Mayor Gloria for uh, inviting us here today. It's good to see you. Um, my question has to do um, selfishly with, with Carmel Mountain Ranch and um, the amount of proposed infill development that's coming our way and, and frankly the amount of infill development that's already underway in other communities um, in District 5 and I'd, I'd like to know how can the city help us protect the character of our community with so much proposed high density development in a master plan community that's, that's already seemingly at, at capacity and particularly as it relates to wildfires, which you just mentioned. Yeah, um, Eric, let me try and field this and if the council member wants to chime in, um, that, that, that's great. Um, first off, thank you for your service to the community, uh, particularly leading uh, a community organization that is uh, sometimes a thankless task and I know it's not compensated. So thank you for what you do, Eric. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, to your specific question, um, you know, the only thing I know of for sure is that communities will change. Right? It, it just happens. You know, the, a business will close and someone else will go in. Change will happen. I think the, the point that you and I would agree on is that um, we should be in purposeful in trying to curate that change in a way that keeps what you love about your community and then welcomes changes that actually address, you know, deficiencies in your community that you care about. And new, new, new development can often do that can also do the opposite. And so that's the that's the that's what I'm hearing in your question is how do you get more of the good stuff that you like and how do you do it in a way that's inclusive of the community? Um, again, uh, hopefully uh, maintaining high level of quality of life, uh, eliminating some of the things uh, that you don't like. So the best way to do that is through a community plans and making sure that they're updated and reflective of community consensus. 
as I think you may know, Eric, many of our city's community plans are horribly outdated. Um, there has been a pickup over the last couple of years in updating these plans, but that those are years long processes. And often while you and your colleagues on the committee are working on those updates, uh, projects are coming in the door uh, that really aren't a part of that process. And so I think it's incumbent upon us to continue to update community plans uh, in a process that is swifter so that, that consensus is reflected. And so the community knows what community community com clearly communicates to everyone what the expectations are and that that is not the expectations of your community 25 years ago, but the concerns of your community today. Well, how are we gonna do that? Um, well, my administration is working uh, right now to try and find ways to make sure that those plan updates can go faster. Um, and what that generally means is the city has to do more of its fair share. Um, often what we are doing is putting the requirements for environmental clearance on these community plan processes, which means multiple years longer, um, and is often technical to the point that it seems exclusive of community participation. There's nothing like talking about a, pro, a programmatic EIR for the average uh, uh, Carmel Val uh, Mountain Ranch uh, resident to say, what the heck is that about? I'm just concerned about, are we gonna have neighborhood serving retail? Are we gonna have first time home ownership opportunity, low income housing, question, 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 right? If we can, as a city, address that and take on that responsibility, allow you all do what you do best, which is to say retail should go here, industrial should go there, uh, then I think we're, we're in the lanes that make the most sense for us. Um, I think often this has to um, also be about infrastructure and making sure that these uh, we are getting developers to pay their fair share for the infrastructure costs that they experience or that their projects may uh, cost. You, I think you may know updating community plans are also an opportunity to update the facility financing plans so that you're not charging 1985 fees in 2021. This is, again, another reason for urgency on updating community plans. Um, and I guess the bottom line on this, Eric, is that in the budget that I intend to propose on Monday, we will not be making any reductions to the planning department or any significant reductions to the planning department, because as you, communities like yours are seeing more development interest, we need to make sure that you have the professionals that are there to be able to work with you to make sure that we're advocating correctly with applicants to get the projects you want, and again, update those fees so that we have the cash to make sure the infrastructure comes to make sure your quality of life is preserved. That's the broad outlines. We could probably have a very lengthy conversation about this, uh, and I'm yes. happy to do that. Um, and maybe uh, you, me, and Marnie can do that because I know there are some very large projects planned for your area. Um, right. But those are that's the broad outlines. Keep the plans updated. Keep the financing plans updated so we're getting our infrastructure dollars. Stay uh, open as transparent as possible. Um, and Marnie, I don't know if you have anything to add on that, but th those would be my initial reactions. Yeah, no, thank you, Mayor. And, um, you know, Eric and I, we've been talking about this for a while. And, you know, when I started campaigning, a lot of these proposals to come in and a lot of the infill development was already in place when Mark Kersey was still in this office. So I know I'm coming to it halfway through and I won't cross that line because I may be voting on this. So I don't have to ever accuse myself. But, you know, fire safety and evacuation is always going to be my number one concern. You know, having grown up in Scripps Ranch, my parents almost lost their home on Sunset Ridge Drive, Sunset Ridge Drive in the 2003 Cedar Fire. So I have been talking to any developer who proposes or is currently working in the D5 area. What are you doing about evacuation times? Because as Eric probably remembers, and many people on this call, it took almost an hour and a half to evacuate folks from Carl Mountain to the 15 freeway in the 2007 Witch Creek Fire. I have talked to the fire department. I know evacuation plans are different and we have new technology and they won't be as bad before, but I'm just glad to hear that everyone is, acknowledges that it's a huge risk for our community and um, making sure that we have the infrastructure. Uh, Mr. Mayor, like you said, I'm the chair of the Active Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. I took over from Mark Kersey's shoes and um, we have an incredible team at the city who really wants to work on making sure that we do have the build out of the infrastructure we need if we're going to increase development in our communities, which we also understand we need. You know, I mean, I, I tell everyone I'm, I'm 38 now and I'm a lawyer and I can't afford to buy a home in Scripps Ranch, the community I grew up in. You know, it's uh, because I can't afford the down payment. And a lot of our teachers can't either, our police officers, our firefighters. And so working with them, our public service professionals to try and figure out first time home buyer assistance for them our down payment home buyer assistance would be really great so that we can keep our the folks who serve our communities living in our communities. And, you know, we're doing our part also in Scripps Ranch. Uh, it, you know, it's under school board jurisdiction, but where the Scripps Ranch Academy used to be, they're now building housing. And a lot of it will be uh, by right affordable for teachers, which is great because our teachers really are some of our, you know, 
firsthand work or frontline workers for us. So um, Eric, keep in touch. I think the biggest thing for us to do is really keep in touch with our office and with the planning commission because the community's voice is so important. And so making sure you were heard in the process is gonna be a big part of, of how we do this going forward, so. And that's what, right. we're, that's what we're most concerned with is that it somehow become a more collaborative process because we are caught a little short in that our community plan not been updated in 30 years. And so now it's kind of being updated for us by developers and we just don't want to get caught flat footed and, and, and um, you know, wind up being a hodgepodge community. We, we, we would like to continue this discussion with, with both of you for sure. It would be much appreciated. Awesome. Me too, Eric. Thank you so much, Eric, for that question. So we'll be moving forward with the next panelist. Um, we have Wally Wolfeck. He is the chair of the Scripps Ranch Planning Group. And I'll hand it over to you, Wally. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for attending. And thank you, Marnie, for being here. Um, the last discussion with Eric raised a whole bunch of issues with me. But the question I submitted in writing, um, you've both already addressed a little bit. It has to do with fire safety in Scripps in particular, but most of District 5. Um, as Marnie mentioned, we had the Cedar Fire in 2003 and um, the 2007 fires, which were evacuations down here, but which affected other, other parts of uh, um, District 5. And um, so what we need is a, a more attention to particularly reducing the fuel load in the area. The Marine Corps conducts controlled burns on the back of the Marine Corps Air Station in Miramar. And um, similar things could be done to reduce fuel load um, in the rest of the district. It's not going to be cheap, obviously, but um, you know, one fire kind of blows the climate action goals for like 10 years. Um, so uh, not to mention, you know, homes being destroyed and people displaced. Um, so uh, we need something, I think, more proactive um, from the fire rescue department and the city as a whole to do something about improving fire safety. Uh, the other problem that we're having in, in certainly in Scripps, but probably in the rest of the district is um, insurance companies are non-renewing policies. And uh, this, this is perhaps a state insurance commissioner issue, or maybe even a federal government issue. But um, many of us are worried that we're going to end up with something like the federal flood program or the California Earthquake Authority insurance program, which is a basically an assigned risk um, kind of thing. Um, so we need, we need some attention on uh, people being able to get and afford um, disaster insurance um, in these districts. Um, so, and you can comment on that. Um, let me just comment on the discussion you were having with Eric about community plans. Um, you're correct that they are being updated, but they're ignoring the communities while they're doing that in many cases. Um, and starting with Barrio Logan several years ago and what's happening now in Mira Mesa and, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's really a problem. And the planning department, um, at least some of the senior leadership of it has been completely out of touch, um, actually proactively out of touch with communities. They ignore us. Uh, they ignore the planning groups, they ignore the CPC. And Mike Hansen in particular has actually said that out loud that he doesn't have time to talk to communities. Um, so I, I, I think there needs to be some adjustment of how these things are going and how to get communities involved in the planning process so that we, as you said, Mayor, end up with things that the community is happy with, uh, that, that is a benefit to the community rather than simply a giveaway to some other special interest. Um, and finally, uh, you know, if you, the evidence for the planning department being out of touch is you look at, for example, the parks master plan or the really awful um, complete communities mobility plan that was passed by council back in November. Um, Mark Kersey voted against it. Um, and I believe Chris Kate did too, because it's really disastrous for the district five, the Northern parts of the city. Um, it ends up taxing um, future residents um, because they have to drive to their jobs. 
Um, and all it does is drive future developments to cities that are more friendly, like Poway or Carlsbad or you know any of the northern communities there. And so it, it, it ends up being a net loss for uh, the city of San Diego, in my opinion. Wally, sorry to interrupt, but if, if, we, if you can just get to the question, because we have lots of questions. And I know we have two other panelists and some piece of mid one. So um, thank you, if, Stephanie. I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we want to make sure everyone gets in on some of this. Um, well, I uh, maybe we, we reverse engineer that um, starting with your last part. I mean, the the parks master plan is being updated. Obviously, the council did not uh, approve that, as I think you know. Um, working now to try and address some of the concerns that were raised by uh, community groups and others. Uh, to your point about past community plan updates, you mentioned Barrio Logan, and I so appreciate someone in Scripps Ranch bringing up that community. Uh, I voted for the Barrio Logan community plan. It was the product of that community. Um, and as many of you may remember, it was referendized um, and it was struck down citywide. So um, the people in that community were not treated fairly by the broader city. Um, and the previous administration said that they were going to update that plan and they were able to get through two terms without doing that. Um, I'm working now to bring the community plan back before council, hopefully before the end of this calendar year uh, to right that wrong. Um, that plan was uh, good on its face, um, why I voted for it. Um, and the fact that that community was heavily outspent by corporate interests in order to have it defeated on a citywide ballot um, is wrong and uh, recognizing that not every community knows the other community's concerns. If someone on Scripps Ranch cares about Barney Logan, that makes me feel like we're headed in the direction I want our city to be headed in, which is that you don't, you may love and revere the neighborhood you're in, but you should care about every corner of the city because we don't live one neighborhood lives, right? I live in Mission Hills, I work downtown, I go to Midway for a lot of my shopping needs, I hang out in Mission Valley a bit, you get my point. Um, so stay tuned on a number of things that are in progress that I think I'm hopeful you'll like. On the fire question, you know, Wally, to the point about insurance rates, yeah, that's more of a state issue. Um, I will tell you that I have known Ricardo Lara for a lot of years. He's our state's insurance commissioner. We have talked about this issue. Um, Wally, I'm, I'm always going to play it too straight. Insurance is not an issue which I'm very good at, right, in terms of uh, expertise. Uh, but I would be happy to rely upon you and others to tell me what you need us to do to advocate with the insurance commissioner. The city has lobbyists in Sacramento that we can mobilize to make sure that whether it's a proceeding in front of the insurance commissioner, a bill in the legislature uh, that would better um, serve the people of Scripps Ranch and these uh, fire prone communities. You tell me where to go and we'll go, right? So because I, uh, again, I'm admitting my deficit in terms of knowing a lot about that. Um, uh, other than a consumer, that's about all what I, <laughs> I got. Um, but I would welcome your feedback. And then lastly, what the city can do is that we can maintain our current or increase our commitments uh, to brush clearance. Um, we can ask our fire rescue department to be more, more proactive. And I believe that we're doing some of that. You know, we're expanding door to door brush management efforts um, to make sure that we're hitting at least 45,000 doors a year. We're using technology so that that data is, is better. Um, and we can see some longitudinal change over time. Again, to try and do a risk associated profile, you know, that we're spending our limited dollars where they're most impactful. Um, Again, the budget's coming out this week. I'm hoping to hold the line on, on our current funding levels. Um, you know, with the pressure for some structural reductions, I don't think this is penny wise to your point. Um, it could be penny wise, but pound foolish. You know, if you're cutting brush abatement, but you have a big fire, you're not ahead at that point, right? You're actually far behind. I get that. Um, and so we're trying to account for that in the budget. And the last thing I would say is that you may have saw the governor uh, announced a um, commitment for fire rescue, I'm sorry, for, for fire management in anticipation of the coming year and the drought and et cetera. Um, that will go before the legislature next week. Tony Atkins, who represents many of you in the state Senate is helping to lead on that. That's a pot of like a half, um, it's, it's over 500, it's a lot of money. And uh, Marnie and I are gonna get really sharp elbows and we're gonna go out there and, and make sure that San Diego gets its fair share of those dollars. Um, so those are kind of the areas and ideas that I have that can address the issues you raised. Marnie, I don't know if you have anything you wanna to add to that. Yeah, no, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Wally, for all the great questions. Um, you know, one thing we have in Scripps Ranch is a very vibrant uh, fire safety council. And I know the mayor's office is working with us to put up different evacuation stations already. So thank you for that. I also met with Senate Pro Tem Tony Atkins yesterday and I raised the issue of the homeowner's insurance to her. And she said she is gonna advocate with Ricardo Lara. Also, um, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. He really does mean it. If, if we have questions for Sacramento, he will get folks up there advocating because uh, the mayor and I chatted about um, something near and dear to me, which is gun violence prevention. And I really want our gun violence prevention restraining order program to be funded so that we get guns out of the hands of anyone who threatens us 
school, a workplace, a place of worship. And I talked to Senator Atkins yesterday. She said, I've already been hearing about it from the mayor's team. So thank you very much for, for uh, communicating our needs to Sacramento um, and also for fighting for brush management and making sure that we do get our fair share of the Cal Fire money. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to be working along with our our firefighters with that too. And Wally, I am keeping a close eye on the parks master plan. They are hearing all everyone's concerns and we're waiting for them to bring out uh, a new new revised plan. So thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, um, council member. So we'll move over to Sarah Clayton. She is a board member for, um, a board member for the Rancho Panasquitos planning group and also a board member for the PQ and E action group. Um, I kindly ask um, everyone if you can keep your remarks in one to two minutes, I'd love to um, have some time uh, for some pre-submitted questions. So thank you so much. Good morning. Um, in Rancho Panasquitos, we have questions about fairness and equity how decisions are made and funding distributed to neighborhoods. What action will you take to make government more approachable, more transparent, with easy access to public information so that local residents can play an active role in their community? Uh, great question, Sarah. Um, so I mean, what we're doing right now is certainly a, uh, in furtherance of that, right? And this is not a one and done thing. We'll be coming back uh, with some frequency because I think this is the best way to address what exactly you specifically said. But we can also do more to sort of structurally orient the city to do that. Um, and it's a part of kind of Wally's question a moment ago, right? Is, um, you know, okay, heard the feedback about the parks master plan, rather than just going to go back at it again, you know, we're internalizing that feedback where, updating it to try and uh, reflect those changes that have been requested by the community. We'll continue to do that. Um, it's as simple as what we did just the other day by updating our Get It Done app uh, to be more transparent. Um, you know, there's been some complaints that you'd make a report and it would just get closed out and without any idea of how it turned out, that feature has been improved to be more transparent. We're putting it in Spanish so that more San Diegans can actually utilize the, the, the tool. So, you know, I'm trying to find ways to do this better. Um, and what I would say is that probably one of the best ways to get citizen participation or transparency is to ha invite you in uh, to government to be participants. Many of you are, are in, involved already on your community planning groups, town councils, et cetera. Um, I would say that you could take the next step and join a board or commission. Uh, there are a lot of vacancies uh, that were left to my administration to fill. We're doing that now. Um, and if you have an interest in serving on anything from the planning commission to the tree board to uh, the park and rec board. I mean, these are places, these are bodies that look at some of these policies that have been mentioned by Eric and Wally um, before they go to the city council or to the mayor for signature. Um, those would be the next place in doing that. And again, this is an open portal on my website. Go to it right now. You can see how you can apply. I would sincerely welcome your uh, further participation in the public process. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Actually, we're gonna start putting out a, a heavy recruitment for District 5 residents to get involved in boards and commissions. We'd love for you, folks, anyone you think might wanna volunteer um, would be wonderful. And Sarah, thank you. This is a very important issue for me, for, uh, transparency and accountability. And on this Zoom, um, all, all my staff are here. So we have uh, our community reps, um, Jack Hopridge is from uh, representing Penasquitos. We've got Eric Young on here for Rancho Bernardo. We've got Quentin Grounds on here who's Sam Pasquale and uh, Scripps Ranch and, and everyone in between. So please do, I know Justin Garber is our policy chief. He's also our infrastructure guru. So that's very helpful. Please do use the Get It Done app because if you do, then you call our office. We can then look up the Get It Done report and follow up on it. So it's very helpful to use for us. Um, and just um, also, and Bridget Naso is on here, who's our committee consultant for COVID recovery. And I just wanna say thank you because many of our community members have also emailed me recently to say thank you to my staff. And it's just, they're working hard. They're working nights, they're working weekends. So it is really kind to hear kind words from the community that I pass on to them. So know if you do reach out, I will let them know. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, council member. So we'll be moving to our last panelist. Um, and she is Robin Kaufman. She is the president of the Rancho Bernardo Community Council. Um, again, kindly asked to keep remarks short. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Mayor and um, uh, Marnie Von Wilpert. We very much appreciate it. And Stephanie for, for moderating this thing. Um, I happen to have um, uh, a little more perspective in our community. Not only have I lived here since uh, I was a 
early teens, so I've been here for 47 years. I've seen our community grow, other communities grow, the city as a whole grow. Um, but I also wear a number of hats in our community. Not only am I president of the Ranch Bernardo Community Council, I'm the chair of our planning board, the president of our recreation advisory board. So those are our three volunteer governing boards in, in our community and most other communities in the city. So I have a unique perspective because I get to hear from all residents about all different things. I do, I know I'm going to keep it to two minutes, Stephanie, don't worry. Uh, but I do want to agree with uh, just about everything that um, Wally uh, mentioned, especially when it comes to the planning department and how they definitely ignore um, the, the planning groups. Those are volunteers who give their time and energy after a full day of work to devote to their community. They research projects, they give uh, you know uh, lots of comments on what is good or not so good uh, on a project pertaining to their community. And 99% of the time, the planning department just ignores it. So with that, my question, because I knew so many others were going to be asking other questions, but this uh, not only re, uh, involves our community, uh, but it, uh, it reflects other communities that are having similar problems. Um, the city is approving marijuana outlets close to regi residential uses, homes, religious facilities, businesses focusing on minors. So instead of allowing this, why not allow them in the industrial park areas or big box centers in communities, as opposed to close to those other um, uh, things that I had mentioned. Sure, let me try and grab that, Robin, and thank you for, wow, I didn't realize you're the head of all those groups, God bless you. There, there's, there's like a Robin in every neighborhood and you just hope that the, all the best things for them because they're so critical to that neighborhood's uh, success. So Robin, thank you for playing that role for RB. Um, so quickly, I actually wrote the city's uh, ordinance for, for marijuana dispensaries. And as you may know, there's a cap on four per council district. Um, they have to be 100 feet from residential and 1,000 feet from sen sensitive uses like schools, churches, other things of that nature. Um, I'm familiar uh, with the one that's proposed in Rancho Bernardo, and our development services staff is, uh, has evaluated their proposal and making sure that it conforms to the distance requirements. Um, you know, there are, I think, concerns about whether or not it does, and we're going to follow the rules as we see them, and then make a recommendation to the uh, to the planning commission um, uh, for their consideration. Here's the thing: I think because you mentioned that's not just an RB issue, but that there's there citywide concerns, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. You know, I want to be really clear. You know, there's these ordinances that are passed are never perfect on their first day. They're often the, re, uh, the reflection of, of, of compromise. And the way that they play out in the real world uh, sometimes don't work out so well. To your point about keeping them in industrial zones, you know, the many of the, it, that's basically where they are permitted. But what you've seen is an over concentration in certain council districts and pretty much nothing in others. And to the point that was made before, I think by Sarah about equity, that's not particularly equitable. And it creates a situation where you find little parcels that may fit the law, but maybe not the spirit um, of the ordinance. And so I think there are some modifications we can make to that ordinance that, again, I wrote several years ago um, and see, based on our experiences on the ground and in neighborhoods, can we make this better so that, you know, they're not shoehorned into places where they'll fit in and instead maybe work in better places. Um, again, some districts have reached their caps, others are, have nothing, um, and that's not particularly equitable and it makes certain uh, properties become even more prized. Um, and, it, and frankly, not anyone's probably too excited about it, uh, about some of these ones because it's one of the few that work. So um, anyway, stay tuned on that, but uh, that, that will get a full public airing um, and I imagine you'll be a part of it and, and I welcome that participation. Keep in touch with our office so that we know how to raise the concerns of the community as well. So we'd appreciate that. Alrighty, thank you so much. Um, we, we do have 10 minutes left. So we'll, we'll moving. pretty good. <laughs> <Not everyone. laughs> um, so we will be moving into our part two of our Q&A. These are pre-submitted questions um, from, from folks here who are attending or folks who weren't able to attend. So this one will be uh, for the council member. This was from a community member, Mary Topple. So her question is, my street, Marisol Drive, which provi provides access to the Rancho Bernardo Inn, is in horrible condition. Staff from the hotel use this road to leave to go north to the access to 115, to the I-15, and with all the TOT use tax that the city collects from the hotel, why are our streets surrounding the hotel in such horrible shape? 
shouldn't the TOT tax be used to mitigate the impacts from the hotel on the surrounding community? Thank you, Stephanie, for the question. And um, we actually just had a whole street repair update uh, at our last ATI, Active Transportation and Infrastructure Committee meeting. Uh, it was last week. So if it's actually online on the city's website. If you look under the city council committees, look under our last meeting and you can see the entire video of the streets department giving us an update about how they're deciding when to repair streets, what's coming up, what the funding levels are looking like. And it's a great question. Honestly, um, road repair is one of the top questions we get city in our district office and so we're advocating every day to make sure that we do get our roads repaired to the condition that they should be in um, and the tot tax is a great question but the tot doesn't it goes into the general fund pot you know 10 it currently stands at 10.5 percent of tot revenue which is the transit occupancy tax which you know tourists pay when they come to town Hopefully we will be getting more tourists very soon, but um, only 55 cents goes into the general fund to be applied towards general government purposes. And so really it's, it's a bigger discussion about road repair. Luckily we do have the gas tax funding that is still coming down, which we will be able to use, which will be a great source of revenue for this. Um, helping to advocate for street repair is something that our office does every day. So please do let us know, keep in touch. I've actually personally gone out to see streets to see what the actual condition is. One of the things we have to advocate for citywide is an updated street um, quality index because the last one we did was in 2015, 2016. So it's been six years since we did a citywide assessment of our streets to see where we need to make repairs and funding in equity. Um, we have slurry seal projects going on. We've got complete overlay projects going on and we wanna catch those streets that are slipping before they become more expensive and have to be complete rebuilds. So I know that you know, the city had not been investing in street maintenance for the past couple of decades and finally we are starting to now so we are catching up but please do continue on the get it done app to let us know a lot of issues that go into street repair are determining when utilities might be coming in such as even AT&T or stg e who might be doing work a, a few months from now so the city will wait so we don't have to rip them up again um, and then of course make the utility actually fix the streets they've ripped up but if you have a street issue let us know because we can then contact the streets department and find out what the plan is what's going on if there's other work in the area things like that thank you thank you so much council member um, so we'll be moving on to the second pre-submitted question. This one is to you, Mayor, um, uh, from community member, Ms. Lynn Owens. Her question is, what is being done to fully seat the police oversight committee we voted for in Measure B? And how are we progressing on implementing Measure B? Thanks for that question, Lynn. Um, so uh, your timing is fantastic. Uh, as for those of you who don't remember, Measure B is a reform to our city's uh, police uh, review board uh, and substantially strengthens and expands their powers uh, to provide more transparency, accountability, et cetera. Overwhelmingly approved by voters last year and it's fallen to Marnie and I and our colleagues to implement it. Uh, as I mentioned, we're proposing our city budget uh, next week, but I announced yesterday as a part of a 11 point plan on police reform, uh, first point being that we will fully and faithfully implement measure B. Um, so I, can preview for you that we will be, when I say fully and uh, uh, faithfully implement, fully funding uh, the police board, uh, given the expanded powers, the need for uh, investigators, uh, attorneys, and others uh, to make sure that board has teeth, the teeth the voters gave it. Um, that takes money. Uh, and despite our difficult budget year, uh, we are giving them the full budget that they're asking for to do their jobs. Um, so that's the first step. Um, we'll uh, continue to do the other portions of this that are not funding related, but that's the first step. Um, then, of course, you know, procurement of staff or recruitment of staff. Uh, we'll definitely in, in invite anyone who wants to work for a dynamic city with a cool mayor and really awesome city council. Um, I'd ask you to apply. Uh, and then back to that question that I believe was it Sarah asked. Um, you know, we're going to need uh, residents to participate on this board. Um, there are a number of residents who currently serve on the existing board, but as it converts, that process for appointment will change slightly and we'll need uh, uh, people to participate. So um, anyway, that news will become much clearer uh, when you see our budget proposal uh, next week. Uh, but again, fully faithfully uh, implementing the Measure B uh, is my commitment to the public. Again, we made the announcement yesterday. You'll see it in the budget next week. Uh, and we'll uh, hopefully adopt that budget starting July 1 uh, and start recruiting for those vacant positions. Now, may I add a, a, yeah. a couple? Yes. Yeah. So um, 
So we have a wonderful group in Scripps Ranch called Stand Up Scripps Ranch, which is fantastic, very civically engaged um, group of amazing women. And they reached out to me about this issue, which I appreciate because then I'm able to quickly uh, respond. And so I did, uh, I'm on the Public Safety and Livable Neighborhoods Committee, which is going to be the committee at City Council that will be shepherding through the Police Review Commission or the Commission on Police Practices. And so I reached out to our deputy city attorneys to see where we are in the process. We should be getting in the next few weeks, sometime in early May, we should be hearing some of the, the proposed ordinance to actually implement measure B. Um, when the voters voted on it, they directed the city council to determine what the definitions are of police misconduct, for example, and uh, what an investigation is. I know I reached out to our personnel department. They are currently drafting the positions for to hire investigators, to hire the executive director. And right now we have an interim board operating and Shane, uh, Charmaine Mosley is the current interim executive director. They have now hired their own independent counsel. So the city attorney's office is no longer providing them counsel. So that part has already been implemented. And one thing I wanna point out about the board is it's not the way it was designed under measure B and the way I am very excited to see it operate. It's not just a reactive board. It's not just intended to react to any kind of police use of force. It's also intended to be proactive and provide advice and guidance to how we wanna see our police, police in our communities. And you've already seen that with uh, the review that the commission did, interim commission did on police practices when it comes to First Amendment rights and protesting, they've already weighed in. And so I'm really excited to see it not just be a reactive, let's fix these things we wanna see done, but also proactive. How do we wanna see community policing going forward? But as the mayor said, the public input is the most important thing. We're gonna to have to start appointing commissioners soon. So if you have interest, reach out to me. If you wanna nominate somebody, reach out to them and have them contact us. So, but I am keeping close tabs on it and I'll let you know when we're gonna have that next hearing in public safety and it's gonna be in a few weeks. Thank you so much, council member. So if, if you all, any of you have uh, any remarks, um, some quick remarks, and then I, I know we uh, are gonna be sharing a, a screen. So just handing it over to mayor and then um, you, you all can turn it back to me. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to conclude. I'll give uh, Marnie the last word. Uh, she's uh, uh, it's in her district, right? So we'll let her do that. But uh, Marnie, thanks for being partnering with us uh, on this. I, I, for some of the folks like Robin and others who I'm sure have seen a lot of mayors and councils come, how many times have you been at a town hall meeting where the mayor was asked a question? They say, oh, that's the council. Or the council members asked a question. They say, oh, that's the mayor. You know, the idea and the value is to have both of us here at the same time. Uh, raising up uh, neighborhood issues like fire safety, like Yanni's, like uh, 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 other issues that are specific to District 5, and then talking about citywide issues like affordable housing, like the budget, uh, like our economic recovery. Uh, that was the intent behind this. I know there are probably more questions. Uh, our practice has been in this is to try and respond to each person individually. If we couldn't ask the question live, um, we'll get back to you. But, um, you know, these are difficult times. Uh, this is a time for more public engagement, a lot less. It may be harder because we can't be together, but there's obviously uh, wonderful tools like this one to help bridge that gap. Um, I need your input more than ever. When resources are small and the demand is high, that means that we really need to be super clear with one another about what your expectations of us are and us sharing with you the facts in terms of our resources, our abilities, our priorities. What I want you to hear from me is that we will defeat COVID-19. We will do all that we can to stand up our economy, get people back to work and get our kids back to school. And then we'll set about the business of tackling, I think the systemic issues that are facing the city, our affordable housing and homelessness crisis, our infrastructure and traffic uh, issues, and then uh, uh, our climate crisis. These are the top issues I think for me. Um, and I know so many of my concerns really align nicely with council member Von Wilpert. I think our partnership together, uh, again, acknowledge what I said a moment ago, this is not the last time we'll do this. We will do this frequently uh, because our partnership together will work for the benefit of District 5 and for the city as a whole. So thank you for honoring us with your time this morning. And Marnie, any final words? I'll toss it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, I'm very proud of our District 5 community. Uh, there's almost 100 people on this Zoom right now. And thank you for taking the time in the in early Saturday morning to be here. I'm seeing so many amazing faces who I miss dearly. Um, I see Kathy on here and Sandy Witzel Smith and Mudita is on here as well. Um, so just uh, and, and Yanni, I saw your question. We're starting a working group to make sure that we come down and talk to you um, about all the housing development issues. So we'll, I know we're out of time, but we'll address that for sure. Yanni's here. Yanni's here. Yes, I just hey! saw. Him. Yes. Yep. We're so, working on this, Yanni. Please give yes. us some time. But thank you for your <laughs> constructive engagement. Yeah, but uh, so thank you so much to being here and please, please, please reach out to our office all the time. And if you have an event in the community, invite me, I will come. 
Um, if, as long as it's COVID safe, I've been out in uh, the Penn Mosquitoes Town Council, had a food drive a couple weekends ago, I attended. Um, if there's anything I can do, let me know and our staff know. And I just can't thank you enough for being here because it's our community that makes this job great. So thank you again and have a great weekend. Yeah, and I know we had so many question, good questions submitted into the chat, and while we weren't able to get to all of them, uh, please email your questions to your appropriate community representative, the staff in the council member's office, as well as my email address are listed in this PowerPoint. Um, thank you so much for joining us for Meet Your Mayor Council District 5, um, and you all have a great Saturday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marnie. Thank you.